Up next in the broadcast, President Bakane hosts a meeting with Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott here in Seoul, where the two signed the finalized Korea-Australia Free Trade Agreement. Microsoft today pulls the plug on its support for Windows XP, and that means Korea with a large XP user base could be vulnerable to security gaps. And pro-Russian sentiment builds in Ukraine with an eastern city declaring independence and calling for a referendum. Primetime News begins now. Good evening to our viewers in Korea and hello to those of you who are watching from around the world. It's Tuesday, April 8th here in Seoul. I am Yuji Hae. And I'm Sean Lim. Thank you so much for joining us. We begin at the nation's top office. Following a bilateral summit between President Bakune and visiting Australian Prime Minister Tony Abbott, the two sides signed a free trade agreement and agreed to boost security cooperation. Our Chu-san has more on Korea-Australia relations in full bloom. Less than a month after concluding a trade deal with Canada, Korea signed its 11th FTA with Australia. Seoul and Canberra agreed to remove tariffs on a majority of traded goods over the next decade. Trade between Korea and Australia jumped from 18 billion U.S. dollars in 2007 to 30 billion last year. Is that it will be very good for both our countries because trade means jobs. Freer trade means more jobs. Freer trade not only means more jobs, but it means better friendships. President Bakune talked about the great potential for energy and resources development cooperation by merging Korea's advanced technology with Australia's vast resources. But their meeting wasn't just about economic ties. The two leaders also adopted a vision statement in which they agreed to discuss a blueprint for security and defense cooperation. They also decided to hold a joint cyber policy dialogue in the near future. Australia also expressed support for President Park's trust-building and reunification initiatives with North Korea, while calling on Pyongyang to put down its nuclear arms and to abide by its previous denuclearization commitments. The vision statement also referred to Seoul and Canberra's joint efforts towards regulatory reforms and streamlining red tape. Similar to President Bach's deregulation drive, the Abbott administration has pushed for reform measures such as holding a massive repeal day twice a year to boost Australia's competitiveness and to create more jobs. On people-to-people -people exchanges, the two leaders agreed to actively support Koreans visiting Australia on working holiday visas and Australians coming to study in Korea as part of Canberra's new Colombo plan. Choi yoo -sun. Arirang News. And now that the trade pact between the two of Asia's largest economies is a done deal, import tariffs on most of their products are expected to be eliminated within 10 years following the implementation of the accord. Our economics correspondent Na Hyun-kyung takes a look at which sectors are expected to benefit most from the Korea-Australia FTA and which ones may take a hit. Korea's trade ministry expects the free trade agreement between Seoul and Canberra to bring about 1.6 billion U.S. dollars worth of benefits to consumers within the 10-year period after the pact is ratified. Korea's chief FTA negotiator Woo tae says Korea's small and mid-sized businesses especially will reap the benefits. Australia has very high trade volumes with Asian countries, therefore competition among Asian nations is fierce within the Australian market. This FTA will help our SMEs gain a competitive edge in the exports market to Canberra. 
Australia has agreed to remove tariffs on 99.5 percent of their items within five years of the deal's ratification. The Korean government evaluates this as one of its most ideal and complementary free trade pacts. Its reasoning is that Korean manufacturing goods, automobiles and petroleum products, for example, will see a boost in exports, while Australian mineral resources, including crude oil, will benefit from tariff removals. But those opposing the deal remain concerned about its effect on Korea's agricultural industry, as tariffs currently ranging from 18 to 72 percent on meat products will be eliminated 10 to 15 years down the road. Along with the recently agreed FTA with Canada, the trade ministry says it plans to continue closely working with agricultural professionals to come up with more comprehensive measures that will minimize any negative impact this deal could have on the nation's domestic sector. Na hyun Arirang News, Sejong. Over in Washington, the nuclear envoys of South Korea, the United States and Japan have wrapped up their first trilateral discussions in five months. The officials exchanged views on ways to prevent further provocations by the North and possible countermeasures in case Pyongyang goes ahead with another nuclear test. Our Hwang Sung-hee reports. Amid growing threats of another nuclear test by North Korea, the top nuclear envoys from South Korea, the United States and Japan met in the U.S. Capitol on Monday local time. The meeting was a follow-up to last month's trilateral summit in The Hague and is the first such meeting since November. South Korea's chief delegate Hwang jung guk told reporters after the talks that the officials focused on ways to prevent further North Korean provocations. They also discussed implementing stronger sanctions with the U.N. Security Council should their efforts fail. Huang added the three officials agreed to seek various ways to resume dialogue that will lead to North Korea's practical denuclearization. Following the trilateral session, the South Korean envoy met separately with its U.S. counterpart Glyn Davies and its Japanese counterpart Junichi Ihara. Protesting a U.N. condemnation of its recent medium-range ballistic missile launch, North Korea raised tensions last month when it threatened to conduct a new type of nuclear test. This sparked concerns a fourth nuclear test was in the works. Recent satellite images of North Korea's nuclear test sites suggest Pyongyang is increasing its capability to conduct future tests, although no signs of an impending test have been detected. But some experts say the regime could push ahead with a nuclear test in the coming weeks, in time for U.S. President Barack Obama's visit to Seoul and Tokyo later this month. Hwang sang Arirang News. The Seoul's air defenses are under serious scrutiny following the daunting discoveries of three suspected North Korean drones in less than a month on South Korean soil. They appear to have spied on all corners of the country by snapping dozens of pictures of key facilities in the South, including the presidential office. For more on the seriousness of Pyongyang's aerial reconnaissance and countermeasures unveiled by the South Korean government aimed at blocking any North Korean provocations, we're joined in the studio by our defense ministry correspondent Kim Bin. Hello there. Hey guys. So Hyunbin, how concerned should we be of North Korea's spying activities through their drones? Uh, pretty concerned because the only reason we found the three unmanned aerial vehicles is they crashed on South Korean soil. Uh, the defense, South Korean Defense Ministry, which has been under fire for allowing the infiltration, did say that the drones that crashed on South Korean soil are not capable of carrying explosives and were only used for surveillance purposes. But some experts say the drone activities should be taken seriously. They say the discovered UAVs are merely a small sample size of the dozens that have probably infiltrated South Korean airspace, which is, of course, a huge threat to national security. If North Korea were to choose to use these drones as attack UAVs, they wouldn't need the camera and other equipment. They'd only need half of the fuel, which means Pyongyang could, in theory, pack it with explosives, with five or ten kilos of explosives, which could kill a whole bunch of people. Uh, in fact, Seoul's defense ministry says uh, North Korea are operating some 320 unmanned area vehicles. So there could very well be more found in South Korea in the coming days and weeks. And due to their relatively small size, less than two meters in length or width, experts suggest it could be difficult to detect the drones, meaning Pyongyang could acquire the capability to attack the presidential palace in Seoul. 
U.S. military installations in South Korea, and even one of the country's nuclear power plants. So, Hyunbin, despite the potential security threats, the technological level of these drones have been called uh, primitive or even antique. How do South Korea's drone technology uh, compare? Oh, there's really, uh, there's really not a comparison, and experts say we're years ahead. South Korea is about 20 years more advanced and makes mid- and large-size UAVs. In 2018, we will have an attack UAV similar to the Predator model made by the U.S., so the gap will increase even more drastically in the years to come. And Hemin, despite a huge discrepancy there, uh, we should never undermine North Korea's uh, weapons capabilities. How is the South Korean government um, countering uh, these trespassing drones? Well, key commanders in every military branch held an emergency meeting on Monday uh, to discuss the uh, drone infiltration. Uh, Defense Minister Kim Gong Jin, uh, who led the meeting, urged all of the military to be at the ready for any threat out of Pyongyang. The South Korean military says it's well equipped to deal with enemy jet incursions and attack UAVs. But as that is much more difficult to detect these types of UAVs because they are very small in size. Seoul says it plans to purchase low altitude radar as soon as possible and other military gadgetry to prevent further infiltrations. The radar the military is looking into purchasing would be multi purpose. It would not only be able to detect small UAVs, but even mortar shells and multiple rocket launchers. The government should set it up in key military and government facilities. Yeah, but what are we going to do in the meantime until the new equipment arrives? Well, the Korean military is currently under development a low altitude radar system that could detect the small UAVs and is scheduled to be uh, in, uh, utilized by 2018. And until then, uh, they have to lean on low altitude radar systems from overseas. There are two different types of high accuracy low altitude radars the Korean government is looking into the Israeli radar system and the British radar system known as PlexTech. The radar system has an altitude range of 10 kilometers and costs $950,000 per unit. The PlexTech system has a range up to 2 kilometers and comes with a price tag of $190,000 per unit. Uh, both radars could detect any object within its range, measuring as small as 0.5 meters in size. But there's a clear difference in price. Experts say if the government wants to cover all, all the metro, Seoul metropolitan area, they would need to buy around 187 units of these low altitude radar systems. For the RADA system, the price would be $177.5 million. For the PlexTech, the price would be around $36 million. All right, thank you very much, Hamid, for that report. Your gateway to the day's biggest stories in Korea and around the world. Breaking news, the hottest interviews, and a whole lot more. Join Arirang's Sean Lim and Yu Ji Hae from the heart of Seoul. Primetime news, weeknights, live at 10 on Arirang TV. Next general elections. In local politics, Korea's opposition party has backtracked on its pledge to abolish a party nomination system ahead of June local elections. It said it will finalize its decision within this week after taking into equal account the votes of party members and the opinions of the public. Rakani Kim reports. Korea's main opposition, New Politics Alliance for Democracy, has said it'll reconsider a previous pledge to abolish its party nomination system ahead of the June local elections. Speaking to press on Tuesday, An Chol Su, co-leader of the newly formed opposition party, said his coalition would make a final decision after taking into equal account votes by party members and public opinion. It's a shift from the main opposition party's original stance. It had previously said it was going to do away with the party nomination system completely as it can be a breeding ground for bribery and corruption. Both the ruling Henry Party and the opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy pledged to scrap the party-centered nomination systems during the 2012 presidential campaign. But the ruling party retreated from its pledge earlier this year, adopting instead a bottom-up nomination system that involves both members of the party and the public. The New Politics Alliance for Democracy is expected to make a final decision on the nomination system this week. 
An's announcement comes one day after the presidential office of Cheung Wade turned down his request to meet with President Park Geun-hye for talks on scrapping their top-down systems. The ruling party criticized the opposition party, accusing it of playing politics with the issue and overturning numerous pledges. Connie Kim, Arirang News. Korea's fiscal soundness worsened slightly last year, something the government is attributing to a rise in the country's national debt. And it also projects that the problem will only get worse with the nation's lower birth rate and higher expected welfare spending. Hwang Jie has the details. Korea's finance ministry said Tuesday that the nation's sovereign debt, including that of regional governments, came to around 483 trillion won, or roughly 460 billion U.S. dollars last year. That is up around 40 billion dollars from 2012. The ministry attributed the rise to an extra budget that was arranged to boost the domestic economy last year. The national debt to gross domestic product also inched up about one and a half percentage points last year to 33.8 percent. The figure still stands far below the OECD average of around 100 percent, meaning that the nation's fiscal health remains sound. Experts say, however, the rapidly aging population could lead to a bigger fiscal deficit in light of growing welfare spending, whereas fiscal income remains subdued. The rate of increase of government revenue will slow down due to the nation's low birth rate, so the Korean economy's fiscal soundness could face problems probably after 10 years. Korea's fiscal deficit to GDP stood at 1.5 percent last year, compared to 1.3 percent in 2012. It marks the highest figure since 2009, when it was 3.8 percent. The government debt does not include pension liabilities that the government will have to pay out to beneficiaries in the future. Korea's total liabilities, including the pension obligations, rose about 20 percent to more than $1 trillion last year. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Microsoft pulled the plug on its support for Windows XP this Tuesday. This leaves anyone still using the over-decade-old operating system without critical security updates. That affects not just personal computers, but business applications, including ATMs. Shin Se-min tells us more. Microsoft termination of Windows XP poses a great security threat to Korea's financial system. Starting Tuesday, Microsoft says it will no longer support the 13-year-old operating system, which means no more updates, no free or paid assisted support options, and no online technical content updates. ATM services may also be affected as nearly 75 percent of the machines worldwide run on Windows XP, according to the manufacturer NCR. Well over 90 percent of the 87,000 ATMs in Korea have not been upgraded from the Windows XP system, raising concerns that the rest are prone to security risks. Windows XP PC users have upgraded and received support for years, but that help will no longer be available. At least one in five personal computers worldwide still run on XP, and while consumers are entitled to carry on using it for as long as they like, those who choose to do so will be much more vulnerable to hackers, viruses, and other security risks. Software will no longer be made to be compatible with XP. In other words, fewer applications will be compatible with the operating system. Although Microsoft has not revealed a reason behind its termination, industry experts say the company is trying to eliminate the competition as it has produced three other operating systems since the release of Windows XP in 2001. Microsoft is ending support for everyday consumers, but it'll continue to maintain and upgrade XP system services in a corporate environment. Some rumors are estimating around a $5 million bill per year. or. Uh, $200 per PC per year for the first year. Microsoft plans to double it every year as well to $400 and then $800 three years down the road. So they are punitively uh, basically requiring companies to upgrade within the next three years. Shin Se-min, Arirang News.
It's time to check on some of the stories making headlines on the global front with our Paul Lee at the News Center. Paul, let's start with the fresh crisis in Ukraine. Pro-Moscow protesters have now seized government buildings in other eastern Ukrainian cities. What's been the reaction out of Kiev? Well, this latest development has sparked fears of a possible second Crimea and even civil war. But U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry says Washington is keeping a watchful eye on the situation and warning Russia to back off. Our Son jing has more. Russia has warned Ukraine against any use of force in the cities of Kharkiv, Luhansk and Donetsk, where pro-Russia activists have seized government buildings to mark their independence and support the vote to join Russia. The Russian foreign ministry in a statement called for the immediate stop of any military preparations, warning that it could lead to outbreak of civil war. The move comes as Ukraine launched an anti-terrorist operation and arrested about 70 protesters on Tuesday, according to a Facebook post by Interior Minister Arsen Avakov. The latest developments have prompted warnings against Russia over further destabilizing efforts in Ukraine. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry told Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov that Washington is closely watching events in eastern Ukraine with great concern and that any moves to destabilize the region would incur further costs for Russia. The two sides are said to have discussed holding direct talks between Ukraine, Russia, the U.S. and the European Union to defuse tensions. White House spokesman Jay Carney said the U.S. was ready to impose further sanctions against Russia should the situation escalate, adding there was strong evidence that some of the protesters were paid and were not local residents. Son jung in Arirang News. Moving on to the hunt for the missing Malaysian airliner. It's day 32 of the multinational search for Flight 370, but investigators still say nothing significant has been found. 28 ships and aircraft were sent out on Tuesday's search mission in the southern Indian Ocean. Regarding the two pings detected yesterday, the chief search coordinator, Angus Houston, says they haven't heard any more transmissions from the suspected black box. Meanwhile, China's and U.S. Navy ships are continuing to scour the remote seas off the western coast of Australia. Authorities have not ruled out mechanical problems as a cause for the plane's disappearance on March 8th, but say evidence suggests it was deliberately diverted. And finally, the International Monetary Fund has cut its growth outlook for the world economy for this year to 3.6 percent. That's a reduction of 0.1 percentage points. The fund's new outlook released on Tuesday cited uncertainties in emerging markets for the downgrade prompted by the U.S. Federal Reserve stimulus tapering. It also said the pace of recovery still remains too weak. The IMF, meanwhile, left the 2014 growth forecast for the Korean economy unchanged at 3.7 percent. That wraps up our look at international stories making headlines around the world. I'll see you back here tomorrow night. Hello and welcome to Primetime Sports. I'm Stephen Che. Now, the first LPGA Major of the year, the Kraft Nabisco Championship, just wrapped up, and despite finishing way down the order, Pagindi retained her number one ranking for the 52nd consecutive week. Pak finished at four over par for 38th place at Rancho Mirage, but managed to maintain her spot. Meanwhile, tournament winner Lexi Thompson jumped three spots to sixth, pushing down Yu Soyeon, Shan Shan Feng, and Paula Kramer down the order. And heading to the pitch, the first bout of the UEFA Champions League quarterfinal second legs are kicking off. First leg action had Real Madrid thrashing Dortmund 3-0 and PSG soundly beating Chelsea 3-1. Real, who may be without Cristiano Ronaldo, is likely to encounter little resistance, while PSG will look to stamp out a comeback by Chelsea, who will have Samuel Etu back in the lineup to spark the offense. And meanwhile, over in the U.S., the Yukon Huskies defeated the Kentucky Wildcats 60-54 to win the NCAA Men's Basketball Championship. The Husky star player Shabazz Napier not only contributed 22 points, but also held his own on the defensive end. It's sweet redemption for the now four-time champions who were banned from the tournament last season. 
And getting to Tuesday's top matchups, it's the Mobis Phoebus and LG Sakers battling in Game 5 of the KBL Championships. Now both teams start fast, but it's Mobis with a three-point lead at halftime. Now LG starts picking up the pace as Davon Jefferson looks alive, but Mobis's Moon Young is too strong to beat, scoring 24 on the night and leads his team to a win 66-65 to go up 3-2 in the series. Now it's action in the KBO. The Tucson Bears hosted the SK Wyverns in Seoul. Now it's the top of the first. SK's leadoff man, Kim Kang Min, he gets a single and eventually comes around. It's 1-0 Wyverns. Now bottom third, Tucson's Min byung -un hits a sack fly to bring one home. It's tied 1-1. Now bottom eighth, this time Min comes home on Oje Won's hit. And the Bears close out the Wyverns to win at home 2-1. And looking at the scores from around the league, we have Hanwha defeating NC 6-2, Kia over Nexon 13-9, and LG and Lotte, they're still battling it out in the top of the 10th. Scores are 2-2. And that's all I have for now. This has been Stephen Chen. I'll see you back here later for more from the World of Sports. This afternoon was perfect for outdoor activities here in Seoul, but some regions are dealing with dry weather. That's right. For more, let's turn things over to our Kim Bogyan standing by at Weather Center. Bogyan. Well, guys, don't be disappointed if you didn't get a chance to soak up some sunshine today because tomorrow looks to be another beautiful spring day. As for now, a dry weather alert has been issued in some parts of the country, including in Daegu. Humidity levels there are down to 21%, so please be on the watch for forest fires. Currently, the nation is under the influence of a high-pressure system from the West Sea, which is why we are seeing clear skies across the map. Tomorrow, daytime highs in the southern regions will jump to around 25 degrees, so it should feel more like early summer. Otherwise, light-passing showers are forecast from late tomorrow evening through early Thursday morning in Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province. Taking a look at tomorrow's readings, Seoul peaks at 20 degrees, while Daegu jumps to 26 and Gwangju reaches 24. Other regions such as Daejeon tops out at 23 degrees while Dokdo and Mount Kumgang make it to the mid-teens. That's all for now, but I'll be back with more after midnight. Thanks, Po Gyeong. And that's our broadcast on this Tuesday night. I'm Yuji Hain Seoul. And I'm Sean Lim. Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.